Okay, so I would like to welcome you back to the second half of our half day syphilis update. Our next speaker is Jean Sheffield, who is a professor of OBGYN at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and she will be talking about congenital syphilis. Excellent, thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, invitation to come and talk to y'all about a topic I am uh, very passionate about, as you all will probably figure out as we go through. I know that you've already received a fair amount on the epidemiology and um, congenital syphilis, or, I'm sorry, and syphilis in the non-pregnant individual. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about syphilis in the pregnant individual um, and a little bit about congenital syphilis and what we'll need to do to help combat that. And Barbara, I am gonna go ahead and share my screen um, just so I can move it so you don't have to. Uh, so, oh, nope, I lied. It says you're still sharing. Okay, let me try this again. Trying to make sure, okay, can you all see it? Yes. Perfect, all right. So let me kind of move on now. So what we're gonna do, you guys have seen these numbers already. This is primary and secondary syphilis uh, and congenital syphilis on the rise nationally. Um, you'll notice primary and secondary syphilis rates have significantly increased by about 53%. And in 2018, we actually saw an increase in 78% um, as compared to 2014. And the scary thing is the 78% increase in females and the 185% increase in congenital syphilis rates from 2014 up to 2018. So this is kind of syphilis uh, over the years, which you saw a little bit of this this morning. Uh, penicillin was discovered in the 1940s and you'll notice a significant decline in total syphilis rates. We did have a bump um, about 87 or so up to early 90s. And a lot of the syphilis research in pregnancy actually comes from that time period. Uh, so we have a, in, some interesting data from that era. And then it kind of stabilized down again. And we always said, my, my mentor, George Wendell, who is, um, who is considered like one of the kings of syphilis in pregnancy, uh, always told me that when you start seeing rises, a whole lot of efforts go into decreasing the rise in education and all that, very similar to what we're doing now. And you start seeing a decline and then it'll stay down for a while. And then as people forget, or as people don't recognize like the new generation of physicians that may not see syphilis normally um, and they don't recognize it, things get a little bit lax, monies get distributed to other things like Zika and COVID and all that. And then rates start going up again. So we're unfortunately in the going up again stage. So everybody always wants to look and see where they're at uh, compared to other states. Um, I'm in Maryland and uh, we definitely have some uh, significant congenital syphilis issue. Certainly uh, you'll notice Virginia and our, our kind of our general area, while not the highest states, certainly have pockets of significant problems with both syphilis and congenital syphilis. And this is what happens in um, pregnancy. So as the primary and secondary syphilis rates go up in females, you start seeing a significant rise in congenital syphilis rates also. And this is up through 2018. And frankly, I find this terrifying, but it makes perfect sense. As more moms get syphilis, more likelihood of the baby getting congenital syphilis. And part of my talk today is to try to figure out how to prevent that increase, even if they, there's an increased number of moms that are pregnant that get syphilis, trying to decrease the rates of the infants getting syphilis. So these are the kind of the interesting uh, things you always talk about males over females, and you know there's always more males than females, but that top red line there, the male to female ratio, I think is fascinating. In the last few years, the rise in females, the concerning rise in females, um, the ratio is starting to change a little bit. It is a reproductive age uh, problem, as you can see. We certainly do have cases of syphilis outside of the reproductive age population, but the majority is in the reproductive age population, which is one of the reasons why we're having so many problems with congenital syphilis. And when I specifically look at females in that reproductive age, um, it's up in all categories, not just uh, specific age categories. We always think about adolescence and stuff, but you will notice up through 2018, 
it's just skyrocketing across the board. So you heard a lot of this this morning, so I'm just gonna go briefly through this right now, but um, it's caused by the bacteria. In, in pregnancy, we always think about, and outside of pregnancy, I always teach my people about the two stages. There's only two stages, because it gets confusing on the other substages, but two stages, early and late, divided by that 12 month time period. And under early stage syphilis, you have primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis, which I know Dr. Rampalo has talked about, and then late syphilis. I'm just gonna show you a few more pictures because I think it's impossible to do this talk without showing some pictures. So in pregnancy, it acts very similar to the non-pregnant individual. Primary syphilis or the primary chancre um, occurs and it is usually painless, whether they're pregnant or not. Um, raised red firm border, flat base. Sometimes it, it has a discharge or gets tender and inflamed if there's a secondary infection over it, but oftentimes it is, um, there's no symptoms and it may be on the vagina, it may be on the cervix. And you know, oftentimes women have no idea they have primary syphilis. It's just not identified. It's not as obvious as say a chancre on a penile shaft of a male. They may have some non-separative lymphadenopathy that resolves. And then um, usually the chancre itself completely resolves. Unfortunately, the bacteria doesn't just disappear usually. So it goes systemic. Once it goes systemic, you start getting the manifestations of secondary syphilis. And in pregnancy, those manifestations are very, very similar. So you may have the dermatologic rashes, things like this, that whole body rash you see in the upper left-hand corner, the palm and sole lesions that you'll see. You can see some of the um, mucus patches that uh, can occur. These are all some of my patients over the years that have had secondary syphilis. They may also have patchy alopecia, so kind of patchy hair loss. Um, and then they also develop about one fifth of them will develop condylomalata, where they have genital lesions. This is one of my patients that have secondary syphilis. I have another picture of one of my HIV positive patients with a primary herpes outbreak that looks very, very similar to this. So remember STDs run in packs. If I see this, I'm thinking secondary syphilis, but could it also be herpes? You know, maybe in a compromised patient or not. So do remember to not just draw the syphilis titers, but draw everything. This is like any other bacterial infection. You know, people feel like, feel awful um, when they have a systemic bacterial infection. So the myalgias, maybe some, you know, tenderness, low grade fever, arthralgias, they just feel miserable. And then the CNS abnormalities that I know Dr. Rampalo talked about um, way back when, when I trained, we were doing lumbar punctures on everybody and about 40% of them would be abnormal, but clinically they were, it, clinically it was essentially irrelevant um, and only about one to 2% truly developed as, uh, the aseptic meningitis. This is a patient that has a resolving chancre there on that left-hand side and the condyloma lata is starting to develop. So take a look for both. Um, as, as you get development of one in resolution of the chancre. And then again, pregnant women are the same as non-pregnant. If you don't do anything, um, it doesn't get identified. They don't come in for care. Uh, as long as they're within that 12 month time period from the time they got it to the time you diagnose them, if they are com completely asymptomatic, they are in that early latent stage. The problem is they are infectious and remember I'm talking pregnancy now, they're infectious not to a partner, but also to their baby. So we have a number of cases of patients that come into labor and delivery that have early latent syphilis that have an infected child. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If they go beyond that 12 month time frame, it is um, it gets to that late latent syphilis where they have no manifestations, um, they're just hanging out. They are also at that stage, occasionally we have patients that will infect a partner or again, infect a, a, a fetus or unborn child um, if they are in that late latent syphilis stage. So we take all of this very seriously. We rarely see tertiary syphilis in pregnancy. Every once in a while we'll see it in somebody that was infected maybe um, at birth uh, and never were diagnosed or treated. Um, occasionally we'll see patients with a gamma or cardiovascular syphilis, but that is incredibly uncommon in our reproductive age population, our, our pregnant women. I did wanna put this in here only because 
when we talk about manifestations of syphilis, you also have to remember that that bacteria goes from a, an infected mother into the bloodstream, into the placenta. So we always talk about the mom, we always talk about the baby, but we kind of forget that middle part, which is the placenta. So I did want to put this in here so you know that the bacteria actually causes a lot of uh, placental changes, um, inflammatory changes, both in the umbilical cord and in the placenta. And um, this is not so you guys can learn about all these different changes and things, because most people could care less about that unless you're an uber geek like myself um, on syphilis and pregnancy. But just to put in there and say, yes, make sure that you evaluate the placenta at the time of delivery in these patients. And then you go from mom, placenta, now you've got the baby. So the bacteria transport, transfers across the placenta to the baby and causes congenital syphilis also. And importantly, this can occur at any stage. Usually we see clinical manifestations of congenital syphilis if the mom is 18 weeks or, or more because a lot of the manifestations involve an inflammatory response in the baby and they don't mount a great inflammatory response until they get up to about 18 to 20 weeks. So a lot of our manifestations we see are in that if they get infected 18 to 20 weeks onwards. However, we do have cases of um, say a patient miscarries at 12 weeks with, and she has secondary syphilis, we have found spirochetes in the abortus um, specimens. And so you can see transfer to the, to the fetus at any gestational age. The diagnosis of congenital syphilis, uh, for those of you guys that are on the call that uh, do this or are listening to this, that um, try to figure out how to, how to confirm a baby has congenital syphilis, it is incredibly difficult to do. There is not just one test that will show you congenital syphilis. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back to that slide. There is not just one test that will say, oh yes, you've got congenital syphilis, um, yes or no. So it is, uh, it is a combination of, you know the mom had congenital syphilis or had uh, syphilis during pregnancy or at the time of delivery, so you've got testing. You then send um, blood on the baby, you send the placenta, you get all the different results trying to figure out what's going on. There is no IgM that is available right now uh, or a no good accurate IgM that is available right now to help diagnose and figure out does has a baby have congenital syphilis. You certainly can do an examination of the baby and try to figure out if the baby has uh, any evidence of congenital syphilis such as high drops, meaning extra fluid, like a bunch of fluid in the abdomen or fluid in the chest, fluid in the skin or around the umbilical cord. The child may have evidence of liver disease already, so the baby may be born jaundiced um, or have a skin rash. And I'll show you some of these pictures. So this is one. This is uh, from a couple of our babies that have had congenital syphilis um, when I was down at Parkland. This is an incredibly thick edematous placenta. This is a grossly abnormal placenta. And then when you actually look at it under the microscope, also incredibly abnormal. And this alien-looking thing down in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, is actually um, a very swollen edematous umbilical cord that went with that um, that went with that placenta. So you can see a whole ton of edema uh, in that cord. And you'll notice in this baby up in the upper right hand corner, this baby looks puffy. Um, this baby had ascites, so the abdomen is incredibly distended. The baby had a big liver, which contributed to partial part of the distension, but also had a lot of fluid um, contributing to the distension of the abdomen. And you'll notice this other baby had multiple skin lesions consistent with congenital syphilis. And this is a baby that had a stillbirth. Most of our babies that end up um, having a stillbirth, we do what we call a fetogram. And in that fetogram, what we do is we're looking for evidence of um, bony changes consistent with congenital syphilis. So you may not be able to see my marker, but um, down here in the leg bone and the femur, say in that upper or the bottom right, the, ex, the, um, the lateral side of that femur there, it's not a nice smooth border of this femur. It's almost like a moth-eaten appearance of that, of that femur. And um, that is evidence of congenital syphilis. And this is one of our baby, this is again the same baby, um, autopsy specimen. And babies have very big livers. I mean, that just, it is what it is. Babies always have big livers. But this is an exceptionally large liver. 
um, of a baby. So this is kind of t all kind of textbook congenital syphilis. But as most of you all know, most babies don't. Most babies that are um, diagnosed with congenital syphilis or meet definition for it don't actually have all these manifestations. So this this definitions for surveillance that a lot of the health departments have to deal with um, are you know you have to look at all the babies born to born that we think have congenital syphilis by symptoms, infants born to moms that were untreated or only partially treated, stillborn infants. So there's a few definitions that you guys use in classifying them. I'm not going to spend a ton of time because I don't want to bore you guys to death. But proven or highly probable congenital syphilis is not actually that common. Um, it is when you see a baby that actually truly has abnormal findings or they have a, um, an RPR or a VDRL that is higher than the mom's titer by about fourfold, or that you actually so you have somebody that knows how to do a dark field, which a lot of people don't know how to anymore, but you have somebody that knows how to do a dark field, and you're able to do the dark field test on some of the lesions for the baby and ends up coming out positive. But again, this is, this is the least common or one of the least common categories you're going to see, a nice, a nice confirmed congenital syphilis. A lot of the ones you guys are going to see are in this possible category or the less likely category. So the possible category are those infants that are normal appearing on exam, their titers, their RPR or VDRL is less than fourfold um, the, of the maternal titer. Uh, the mom may just not have been adequately treated or not treated at all, or the mom was treated with a non-penicillin regimen, which we'll talk about in a minute, or they were, within, they were within the 30 days of treatment, so they got adequate treatment, but it's still within that 30-day time period. All of those, um, the infant ends up getting classified as a possible congenital syphilis. And then the less likely, if everything was done right, mom has no issues, neonate is completely normal, that's the congenital syphilis less likely category and the unlikely category even less, even, um, even, even less likely. So uh, those are kind of the four categories you guys have to deal with all the time. So let's talk about pregnancy. Well, as, as I mentioned earlier when I was showing you the different pictures, pregnancy itself doesn't uh, change what um, syphilis usually looks like. Unfortunately, syphilis markedly affects the pregnancy. It can be devastating to a pregnancy. This is data that we had, I, I spent 18 years of my life at Parkland, and this is data that we had out of Parkland during that big um, increase in syphilis uh, in the country. We had a huge increase in Dallas also. And what we did was we took a look at every woman that walked in the door of labor and delivery. So they come in to deliver their child. If they were diagnosed with syphilis at the time they walked in the door to deliver their child, these were the outcomes. These were the numbers of babies that were actually infected. So if a mom walked in the door, had her child, and she had a primary syphilis diagnosis at that time, the chance the baby either had a, stillbirth, a congenital syphilis stillbirth or had congenital syphilis actively, or active congenital syphilis was about 23%. Notice if a mom had secondary disease when she, had, uh, when she came in to deliver, up to 60% of those babies had, congen had congenital syphilis, whether it be stillbirth or live born with a diagnosis. But even in the early latents and the late latents, we did have some babies that were infected. And then the unknown category, you know, who knows what those were? Those are the ones where we just don't know how to classify them. They're, they're, they're a, a latent of some sort because they don't have symptoms, but we don't know how long they've actually had it. So that's why that category is kind of between the early and late, late in syphilis. So in knowing all of this, you know, we know syphilis is a huge problem in our reproductive age population. We know the numbers have gone up. And we, unfortunately, we also know the numbers of congenital syphilis have gone up. So the big question is, how do we prevent this infected mom from infecting a child? And the only way to do it is to identify these women that are infected and make sure they are treated before delivery and treated early enough before delivery to give enough time for that penicillin to cross the placenta and treat the infant also, or to at least treat the mom before that bacteria ever crosses over to the baby. 
So we've got to prevent or at least treat maternal syphilis. So this is um, some data out of, um, uh, out of 2015. And this was, this was back when they noticed a 36% increase um, in syphilis rates at that time. And what they did was they noticed that one primary and secondary syphilis rates had increased, which we expect. Um, we see that a lot. Uh, we also noticed that about a fifth of them had no prenatal care. So we like to blame it on, we like to blame some of it on, oh, the women just didn't come in for care. We didn't, we as physicians or we as healthcare providers didn't have a chance to identify them and treat them. But that's actually not true in a lot of the cases. So about 22% had no prenatal care. If, however, the other 78% who had prenatal care, 43% of them actually did not get treated. 16% weren't tested, 39% seroconverted some point during the pregnancy and didn't get identified, and about 17% were identified and treated, but unfortunately they were treated in that 30-day window. So even if they did everything right, which they did in that 17%, they did everything right, but the baby still ended up getting classified as congenital syphilis because it was less than 30 days. These are, I wanted to put this in here because that was like the national data but our national study, but we noticed the exact same thing when we took a look at it in Maryland. So when we took a look at it in Maryland from 2016 to 2018, literally we noticed that 28% compared to the 22% national, 28% had not had prenatal care, but the other 72% had prenatal care. Some of them were delayed first visits, but the scary thing is 72% of those had a timely first visit a timely syphilis test and not all of them ended up getting treated or retested afterwards. When we look at Maryland, so when we look at state specific data um, and looked at our patients, uh, the history of STDs, you know, that was a big risk factor, obviously. Delayed or no prenatal care, some that was, del again, delayed. Um, sex uh, with a high risk partner, of course. Uh, commercial sex workers, incarceration, all play, all play factors. So let's talk about a little bit about syphilis testing. And again, you heard some of this, so I'll talk about some of the different nuances uh, with pregnancy um, as we kind of go forward. So when you start looking at syphilis testing, there are a number of different ways to do it. The old fashioned way, I wish I could, actually I should have uh, grabbed it. I have my dark field filter from Parkland sitting up on my file cabinet right at about two feet from me. Um, I, there are very, very few people in, um, nowadays outside of the health departments and outside of the ID people and such that know how to use a dark field filter to be able to identify um, the spirochetes anymore. So the old way, you know, with us taking a cotton swab and scraping a lesion and putting it under a dark field microscope and, and finding these nice little tightly coiled spirochetes, those days it, we still do it, but we are limited in the number of people that know how to do that anymore. I also put the rabbit infectivity testing in there because if you guys have gone through and looked at old syphilis literature and especially a lot of the pregnancy literature, um, the old way of confirming somebody had syphilis was you took a scraping of a lesion or in pregnancy standpoint or case, we would sometimes take amniotic fluid samples. We put a needle into the uterus and take off some of the amniotic fluid. You would end up um, injecting these fluid specimens that you've obtained into the testicles of these big New Zealand white male rabbits. And then within you know, a week to 10 days, if the testicles were very inflamed, you would actually remove the testes, look at them under the microscope with a dark field filter, find all the spirochetes. That is the traditional rabbit infectivity testing for syphilis. And a lot of the earlier studies had that. Most of us that have done syphilis research have had the pleasure of uh, working with syphilitic rabbits uh, in our past and they're, they're not real pleasant to work with as you might expect. The good thing is from a clinical standpoint, our people don't have to do this. They don't have to be messing with rabbits and frankly they don't, you know, dark field is incredibly nice to be able to do for the acute diagnosis, but you can draw a tube of blood. So when you draw that tube of blood, the serologic detection, you can either do, look for non-treponemal antibodies uh, such as the RPR or the VDRL Essentially, they're looking at antibodies to things the body produces in response to a syphilis infection. So the RPR, the VDRL are kind of standard one, the trust, the old ones. Um, and then you can look specifically for treponemal antibodies. And again, I know we've already gone through this, but 
I wanted to bring it back again and mention it because these do play a problem in the diagnosis of syphilis in pregnancy. So the treponemal antibodies, very specific against the treponemal proteins um, themselves. That's the FTA ABS, the MHATP, the TPPA, um, and all these new screening ones, all the EIAs or C and CIAs are all done um, as treponemal antibody tests. So syphilis serologic screening algorithms uh, for, um, for uh, identification. I still love the traditional, but unfortunately, from a money standpoint, et cetera, most places, including my own place, have gone to reverse sequence testing. The problem with reverse sequence testing in pregnancy is it takes time. So you do your, you do your screening, then if that screen comes back positive, then you do your RPR. If that RPR comes back positive, great, you can move on to the next step. If it comes back negative, you then have to do a third test, another treponemal antibody test, the TPPA or whatever your lab uses. Um, and as you start working through this, you have to remember in pregnancy, you have a very short time period. So say you're doing labs at 28 weeks, which a lot of, a lot of states require um, syphilis testing at 28 weeks. Say you get an EIA at 28 weeks and you have to go through the process. Sometimes it takes a long time depending on where you're at. Sometimes it may take weeks to get all three of the steps done, at which point you then have to get the patient in, counsel them, treat them, treat them again. Um, and then oftentimes you end up in that 30 day window before delivery and you still end up with a baby that has congenital syphilis diagnosis, though maybe not clinically, clinical manifestations. So one of the downsides to reverse testing is it just takes longer in pregnancy. It also has a little bit higher false positive rate. So all of these are a little bit higher false positive rate in pregnancy. So you have to make sure you have confirmation before you end up telling a patient they've got it. And then let's finish up just with treatment. So this is actually the original non-penicillin treatment options. I, I love history and Again, I'm, I'm sitting in my office looking at all my old historical stuff. I have all these great monographs and things. And, you know, they used to, they used to remove, like literally just cut out the lesions thinking that this will take care of, this will take care of the syphilis. They would starve patients. They would give them mercury. That was like the big drug for a long time there until not the night, early 1900s, at which point they had a new drug, which is arsenic, that they said, even though it's a poison of kings, it was called the savior of syphilis. Um, We've gone through a bunch of different things, including abstaining from tobacco and rum, which I thought was fascinating. But in the 1940s, we found penicillin, and penicillin has been the most amazing thing from the standpoint of the treatment of syphilis, both out in, in and outside of pregnancy. So I put that in there because penicillin is the only drug that um, is, is effective in the treatment of syphilis consistently in pregnancy. Um, so we've tried a lot of different things, erythromycins and such, but not all of them cross the placenta well and treat the fetus. So they end up with like a 10 or so percent failure rate, completely unacceptable when you're talking about an infected infant. So as of right now, the only way to treat a mom and effectively treat an infant is using penicillin. So, and it is incredibly effective. You'll notice 100% in you know cure rates for these. The ones that there appear to be some failures, we've gone back and looked, and the vast majority of those. This was a study we did out of Parkland many years ago. The vast majority of those were um, were reinfections. Those were not treatment failures specifically. So what counts? This always gets asked. So what counts as adequate maternal treatment? So in pregnancy a missed dose is absolutely not acceptable. So if you have somebody that needs three doses and they get two and they don't get that third dose, they officially are, a, are officially a failure of appropriate treatment. They were not adequately treated. So if a patient misses a dose or frankly goes beyond seven days um, between their first dose and their second dose, they have to restart the course um, or they are considered inadequate. And the CDC, you guys know, officially defines adequate response in a patient as a drop in titer fourfold. The problem with that in pregnancy is that drop in titer can take a long time. So this is data that we published a few years ago 
um, out of some of the data we had out of Parkland. And you know, it can take six months, 12 months, 18 months for a titer to drop fourfold. We've looked at pregnancy and you'll notice in the, um, in the uh, secondary and primary syphilis titers, oftentimes much higher, these are uh, mean titers, um, oftentimes you'll notice a pretty rapid drop, but similar to non-pregnancy, the unknowns, the late latents, the early latents, they take a long time to go down. And remember, pregnancy is a very short time period. And so oftentimes, if a mom is diagnosed at, say, 18 weeks and has a titer of 1 to 64, by the time they deliver, they may not have a titer down to 1 to 16, or their titer is 1 to 4 at the time they're diagnosed early and pregnant, and they probably have late, latent disease. They get their adequate three doses, but a 1 to 4 would have to go down to a 1 to 1 by delivery, and oftentimes it takes longer to get there. So at delivery, if they haven't dropped fourfold, that does not mean they were a treatment failure. That just means they may not have had enough time um, after appropriate treatment. I want to mention this only because we talked about there are manifestations in a baby that we can actually see on ultrasound, big liver, extra fluid, real thick placentas, the demodus placentas. We can see a lot of these things in ultrasound. And if we treat a mom, we can actually find those ultrasound findings. We can watch them over time as they get better. So a big liver, over time, if we give it enough time after treatment, we can watch in the fetus via ultrasound that liver size go down. It may take a few weeks, but we can watch it go down. Um, there's also, if you actually draw blood from the fetus at, you know, dur in the, during the pregnancy, if you actually take a sample of blood, you can see abnormal liver tests and you might see um, uh, hematologic abnormalities. We can see those normalizing over time if we keep doing uh, repeat blood sampling. So I did want to put this in here also because I get asked about this a lot. What do we do in worldwide? So, you know, here in the United States, we do have every once in a while pockets of penicillin shortage. We've all had to deal with that. But worldwide, it is a significant problem. And this was actually addressed by the World Health Organization in 2017. They looked at a number of different anecdotal reports of benzathine penicillin shortages, collected data, and you'll notice about there was about a 41% benzathine penicillin shortage, whether it be financial, whether it be supply chain, but 41% uh, of the, um, of the uh, reports they looked at, there were shortages. And so World Health Organization came up with recommendations for what to do if you don't have penicillin. And I'm not going to read through all these, I promise, that would bore you to death. But I did want you guys to know that if bicillin is not available, there are other options, um, the, you know, azithromycin or ceftriaxone. So there's different recommendations uh, in the World Health Organization that, you know, I'll, I'll go through if you guys want to read it, but these are not optimal. And the important thing is if you use a non-penicillin regimen, if you have to use a non-penicillin regimen to treat a pregnant woman, you have to make sure that baby is evaluated and treated also. And this is just a, a paper um, in sexual and reproductive health matters, looking at 62 guidelines from around the world out of 128 countries. And a number of them do address the penicillin shortage. Not all of them, but a number of them do address the penicillin shortage. So some of the ones that have been mentioned, ceftriaxone uh, is certainly being looked at, particularly in the non-pregnant individuals. Uh, unfortunately, there are no treatment trials in pregnancy comparing it to benzathine penicillin. So here in the U.S., we do not recommend it um, at this stage. Cefixime, there's a study looking, again, in non-pregnant individuals. Azithromycin, because of azithromycin uh, resistance, it rapidly developed. We do not recommend that at all anymore, though we used to talk about it. Right now, the goal is to use benzathine penicillin. And we do the same treatment regimens. In an early stage disease, we will do one dose, now, a lot of people are concerned that that one dose, you still have to get that medication to cross the placenta and treat the baby. And so the concern is, will that one dose be optimal? Not for the mom, we know it's optimal for the mom, but is it optimal for the baby? So a lot of places, and, in, and I am one of them, 
I will, in early stage disease, give a second dose of bicillin a week later. If um, somebody has uh, if somebody has late stage disease, you get the three doses of benzathine penicillin G. Uh, and again, if somebody is penicillin allergic, one, you have to confirm they're penicillin allergic, because as you guys know, a lot of people that think they're penicillin allergic, when you do specific testing of the penicillin molecule, they're actually not allergic. They had a reaction when they were a kid to something the penicillin was mixed in, like some of the horse serums or such. So it actually is not a significant problem anymore, um, or not as significant numbers that we used to think it was. So if somebody says they are penicillin allergic, if they can, we skin test them or we give them an oral challenge. And if they are negative, great, we give them their bicillin. If they are truly penicillin allergic, they anaphylact to penicillin, we still have to give them penicillin in order to treat the baby in a pregnancy. So what we do is we do a whole desensitization protocol where we bring them into labor and delivery or bring them into an ICU. The allergists get involved with pharmacy and we literally start giving them just very low doses and work our way up to a full dose. The good thing is if you desensitize them with that first dose, you're able then to, um, you're able then to get that second and third dose in without having to go through the whole desensitization process again. It lasts for a little bit of time. And so you're able to just a week later give them their next dose and the following week give them their third dose if need be. So my final message kind of for this part of the talk, and usually then I just open it up for questions and such. My final message is just in order to decrease congenital syphilis, we really have to wage this battle on four fronts. So it is, it is the obstetrician, the pediatricians, the healthcare providers. So it's not just obstetricians, it is midwives, it is family practice, it is emergency rooms, it is health departments, it is any care provider has to, has to know what syphilis is, has to be able to recognize it, has to know how to diagnose it, and has to know how to treat it. So we've got to tackle it on all those fronts and obviously the public health service. It does mean no good to treat somebody or to get a test back that says one to four, and I have no way of knowing where they treated, do I have confirmed treatment two years ago? Was there titer one to 128 two years ago and now it's one to four and I can go yay? Or were they treated two years ago and they went to non-detectable and now they're one to four and I go, uh-oh, possible reinfection. So we can't do this without our health department colleagues also that we can determine, you know, what are old titers and such. You guys are doing, uh, you know, the healthcare provider or the um, public health services are, are tracking babies and they're making sure people come in for care. We used to, in the old days in Dallas, when I was um, there, we had such a large uh, um, number of patients with syphilis that we actually had a health department epi in our clinic, in our obstetric clinic, um, one day a week. We would bring, they, sometimes she would bring in cases or bring in patients with congenital syphilis or with syphilis to come into clinic to be treated. So we had, um, she was there with us. We were kind of in the trenches and, but we could not have done it without her. So um, we can't do it. The, the clinical side, I, I, you know, my side type thing, can't do it without everybody involved. Um, and that's the only way we're gonna be able to work. Uh, let's see. Oh, this was, I put this slide in here. I just wanted to show you guys the penicillin desensitization protocol. This is the one that George Wendell published in the New England Journal years ago. It is a long involved po uh, protocol. That's what a lot of people still use, but there are shorter regimens out there that can be used. So this is the CDC, congenital syphilis, the threat reemerges that was put out a couple of years ago. There's a ton of um, information uh, out there. Um, with the CDC, I have um, I have the Maryland one there too, the Maryland Department of Health, because we have we use a lot of this data um, and have put together some also. But this is the congenital syphilis data that is available on the CDC website to everybody. Um, they are a huge resource. And with that, um, I will stop with you know my my Hopkins Osler quote: "He who knows syphilis knows medicine," because syphilis will manifest in so many, many, many different ways. Um, and pregnancy adds just a whole nother dimension to how it may manifest by, by involving the placenta and inv involving the uh, baby. And with that, I thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, attention. I did put my email in there.
in case y'all have questions that you think of outside of the um, chat. And I will stop sharing my video. Oh, not stop video. I will stop sharing my screen. Let's stop share. And I will open it up to questions. Okay, and I would like to remind everybody, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. Um, and we'll take a few. Um, I know there was one that came up actually during Anne's lecture earlier today that I'll just bring up again because it was specific to pregnancy. Someone was asking earlier if pregnancy itself can cause a false positive treponemal antibody test. So that's a great question. Um, we, have, <laughs> we have dealt with this for so many years. So the non-treponemals, as you probably mentioned, the non-treponemals um, have potentially up to about a 1% false positive rate. The treponemals are much more specific. Now the problem is those are the, the, the TPPAs and the MHATP, um, those are pretty darn good. The problem in the CIAs and the EIAs, these, these, um, these big complex, you know, the big multiplex screening that can go on and all that, the big platforms that are much cheaper to do and you can do a ton of samples and such, those have, those we do think have a high false positive rate in pregnancy. I think they have a high false positive rate for everybody. That's why it's a screening test and you have to confirm. But um, in pregnancy, we think that, especially in low risk populations, they have a significantly high false positive rate. So that's why you then have to go to the RPR and then if it's positive, um, then you have to go to, or negative, then you have to go to the TPPA or the MHATP, whatever you're using to try to get better or to try to get true confirmation and better data. So yes, some of the newer um, treponemal antibody tests that are the, the rapid or the faster ones, um, big high throughput ones, do have a failure rate, but we know, and we know the non-treponemals do in pregnancy. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions yet in the Q&A, but please right. enter any that you like. Let me, while um, if, if people are thinking about questions, let me address one other thing that I didn't mention um, that it is a little bit different in pregnancy. So for those of you guys that do a lot of syphilis um, management, everybody's very familiar with the jarish herxheimer reaction that occurs in um, patients, particularly patients that have, say, secondary syphilis. They have a lot of bacteria in the body. You go ahead and give them penicillin, which they're exquisite with, you know, the, the spirochete is exquisitely sensitive to penicillin. It very rapidly lyses. But then you get some. Then you get this Jarish Herxheimer reaction, um, which essentially is a body's response to this rapid lysis of the bacteria, and you can get you know low-grade fevers and myalgias and all that after treatment, usually for about 24 hours. Not a big deal in the non-pregnant individual. The problem is when you give bicillin to a pregnant woman and that bicillin crosses the placenta. If you have a baby that is infected already and has a high spirochete load, that baby, all the spirochetes are also lysing, and the baby may have a lot of problems with the jarish herxheimer reaction. There have been um, rare reports of uh, a stillbirth, uh, reports of if you have a baby on the monitor, watching the baby's heart rate start going down. So the baby actually may have a jarish herxheimer reaction also. So in pregnant women, that are further in pregnancy where we would intervene on an infant if there was a problem. If we actually, before I treat a pregnant mom, I actually do an ultrasound. If the ultrasound shows early evidence of congenital syphilis already, I treat them actually up on labor and delivery while they're on the monitor. Okay, next question. How would you recommend that mothers with syphilis are counseled about the potential for their children to have lifelong positive syphilis test results? That, you know, I have never been asked that question before, and that is an incredibly thoughtful question. So the good thing is, well, it depends on the scenario. So if a mother is positive and has antibodies, and you are absolutely correct, that IgG antibody crosses the placenta, goes to the baby, um, and hangs out in the baby. If the baby is not infected, 
and the baby is born and all the baby has is the IgG antibodies from the mom, those are actually cleared in about 12 to 18 months. So, or up to 18 months. Or actually most, most of these are cleared much faster, but you can see clearance up to about 18 months. Um, if the baby though is infected, uh, so, so you have a mom that's infected, if a baby truly is infected and the baby is making its own IgG, the, those IgGs certainly may stay positive for many, many years. In theory, it could stay positive for life. Though I can tell you a lot of, um, uh, not a lot, but some of the people that are infected perinatally, um, if you follow their titers out for years, which a gentleman named Pablo Sanchez has followed some of these um, kids out, sometimes those, the, over time, those IgG antibodies um, will go down to non-detectable. It's true for us too, you know, so infections I got as a child, you know, if I had strep throat as a child, I may not have antibodies anymore, even though 20 years ago I did. As we age, some of those antibodies start um, dwindling. So, uh, so but it, it's a great, great question. It's true for HIV, it's true for all of that. If the baby was infected with congenital syphilis and still has antibodies, I, you've got to, when they're old enough to understand you do have to sit down and talk to them because it'd be horrible if they um, end up in a pregnancy themselves 20 years later, test positive and have been faithful to a partner and their partner has been faithful. So you've got to have that conversation. The good thing is that is a very, very small percentage of people that you would have that conversation with. While we're waiting for further questions too, I'm just gonna do a real quick plug in case people didn't see it in the chat during the lecture. Um, Dr. Sheffield mentioned um, dark colonoscopy. Um, and if you are a clinic that, if you already have a bright field microscope, so if you're a clinic that's doing wet preps or whatever, and you were interested in learning about dark field microscopy or learning how to do dark field microscopy that is um, a course that our PTC offers. So feel free to contact us for further information. And there are good YouTube videos and all that online. This is actually, I don't know if you can see it, but this is actually one of our dark field filters that I stole from Parkland. Um, this one's broken, so I was able to steal it. But it is, um, it is, it is an, I, I know old is not always bad. Um, it has been around for a very long time and it is incredibly useful in the acute hair setting to get a quick answer. If you see a shanker or something suspicious for say a herpes lesion or a shanker, do all your normal tests. But it's very helpful to be able to take a look and if you see spirochetes um, on the, uh, uh, under a dark field, know that bicillin is the way to go. So it's incredibly useful, even though I'm always a, uh, I'm always a, if you err on the side, if you think you may have syphilis, particularly in a pregnant woman, err on the side of treatment um, as you're doing your evaluation. Oh, uh, Anne, Rickard, that's actually a great question. So the question is in the chat box, is a baby automatically treated at birth? This is an incredibly difficult answer um, in a couple of ways and a couple of factors. So if a baby has confirmed or probable, absolutely. Um, but You'll if, when you talk to the pediatric ID guys, they will tell you some babies will need um, 10 days of penicillin. The exact same baby in a hospital right next door may get one dose of penicillin with follow-up. Some babies um, will be evaluated, not given penicillin, and then followed. So, so much depends on your system, kind of where you're at, what the ability um, of your system to follow up these babies, um, what the patient population is. Do you think this mom will bring the baby back in or do you think they may get lost to follow up? A lot of people will err on the side of treating. Um, I am, I, I'm like, the, you know, with the mom and everything, I'm certainly on err on the side of treating. I'm the same way with the baby. So um, whether you treat for one day or one dose or 10 doses over 10 days um, is very variable depending on where you're at. But yes, quite often the baby will at least get one dose um, but, and then get follow-up set up. It just depends on the scenario, whether the baby has any clinical manifestations, whether the mom was adequately treated, and if it was just within that 30 days, or was this a mom with no prenatal care that has secondary syphilis, 
that baby is going to be more aggressively treated. So it just depends on your, pedi your pediatric ID um, group at your hospital and what your patient population is. I have one question that I'm now trying to remember if you already addressed in your lecture, um, All right. which is I know there were some studies that looked at treating pregnant patients with two bicillin dur during early mm -hmm. syphilis um, rather than one. And um, I wonder if you could just speak about that briefly because it may come up for other people somewhere. Sure. So if you guys are uh, avid readers of the STD treatment guidelines, um, you will see a couple of sentences in there on the treatment of pregnancy. And the way the 2015 ones, and I think the 2000, I mean, I think it goes back at several iterations, has this sentence in there where it says, you know, they talk about, you know, the, the treatment is the same, give one dose, but then there is a sentence in there, some experts um, agree or some experts feel that a second dose a week later of bicillin um, is required to adequately treat the infant, or I'm sorry, to treat the fetus. So this is before delivery. And um, so I trained actually, so George Wendell is, was very passionate about that. And I, obviously he was my mentor when I trained down in Dallas. I, I'm born and bred with that second dose in early stage disease in pregnancy being required. Um, unfortunately, there really aren't any good studies looking at one dose versus two dose. There are places that do one dose, there's places that do two doses, but there is no head-to-head -head comparison of one dose versus two dose in a large pregnant population. So we don't have a definitive answer to that. Um, so it kind of all comes back to pharmacokinetics and such, penicillin, penicillin actually, or bicillin, very rapidly crosses the placenta, very rapidly treats the infant, but the concern is always, are there, does it cross the placenta in a high enough dose to not just treat some of the spirochetes, but treat all of the spirochetes? Um, and does it last long enough um, as it crosses through the placenta to the baby? So a lot of people err on the side of giving a second dose a week later, but the guidelines, are, the guidelines don't give you a definitive answer. They just say some experts agree. I happen to be one of those that gives a second dose. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. I am not either. Um, Do you see Dr. Ganim on? Yes, and so um, if there aren't any further questions, we'll move right on ahead to our final presentation of the day, which is um, Khalil Ghanem talking about complications, unusual presentations, and clinical gray areas. So we're gonna start off and we're gonna finish up big. So take it away, Dr. Ghanem. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Bear with me one second while I do that. So, okay, so let's do this. Um, I'm hoping that you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, uh, so again, I'm delighted to be here. Jean, Happy New Year. Um, and um, hopefully you'll find this lecture useful. Uh, feel free to, you know, put in any questions you might have. I will try to address them as I'm lecturing and certainly at the end of the lecture. Um, and so uh, we're going to be talking about complications, unusual presentations, and clinical gray areas. This is complex. Uh, syphilis, there's a lot of uh, gray and some black and white, but not as much as you'd hope for. And so hopefully this will highlight uh, these issues without confusing you. At the end of the day, I think you need to sort of adopt a strategy uh, that uh, is reasonable for you. And I will share with you the strategies that I've adopted uh, that I find uh, work well for me in uh, uh, four uh, areas that are gray. So um, I have no disclosures. And our objectives uh, are going to be to discuss clinical manifestations and management of syphilis, to review indications for a CSF examinations, a lumbar puncture, 
and to describe the approach to managing unruly non-treponemal titers. You've all faced, if you take care of patients with syphilis, you've all faced that RPR that just doesn't want to go down. And so we can come up with some ideas about what to do in those situations. So it's going to be patient-centered, and we're going to start with our first patient, who's a 56-year-old transgender woman, uh, HIV-infected, HIV RNA, 23 copies. The last CD4 count was high, 716 cells, uh, and, but it was back in 2017. All these numbers were back in 2017. She is on antiretroviral therapy. She presents with bilateral eye pain, redness, photosensitivity, vision loss, retroorbital headache, and bilateral tinnitus. So eye findings, ear findings, and headaches. She first developed a rash over her legs, palms, and soles about a month earlier, and also noticed at the same time some flat, painless lesions on her genitals. She gradually developed headache, followed by right eye pain, redness, photophobia, and blurry vision. And then subsequently, she had involvement of the left eye. She was seen in the emergency room initially and was diagnosed with conjunctivitis and was sent home on eye drops. This is a real patient. Uh, and she also noted tinnitus in both her ears, but no hearing loss. So finally, she comes back to the emergency room and says, listen, now both my eyes are involved and I'm hearing ringing in my ears. Uh, and so she was seen by ophthalmology and diagnosed with anterior uveitis. Uh, her laboratory tests showed essentially an alkaline phosphatase that was 602, uh, that is high, AST and ALT were only slightly elevated. Uh, of course, her RPR was positive at 1 to 64 with a positive treponemal CIA. So uh, with this patient, the questions that I have are, does this patient need a lumbar puncture? Does she need a CSF examination? Will the CSF examination change management? And if so, how does it change management, right? So um, what are the diagnoses in this patient? This patient has clearly with the rash and the lesions, she has early syphilis. She probably had primary on secondary uh, syphilis, stages of syphilis, at least one month earlier. Now she also presents with a headache, uh, and that certainly suggests the possibility of neurosyphilis. She has a whole bunch of ocular findings, including bilateral redness, decreased vision. She's got uveitis. And so, of course, ocular syphilis is, uh, uh, is uh, the most likely diagnosis. She has tinnitus, uh, and that certainly raises the possibility of otic syphilis. And this patient has an elevated alkaline phosphatase with mildly elevated AST and ALT, so she's got syphilitic hepatitis most likely. And this is classic for syphilitic hepatitis. The alkaline phosphatase is high. It can be as high as 2,000, 3,000, but the AST and ALT are less than usually 200, and sometimes they can even be normal. That is classic for secondary syphilis and syphilitic hepatitis. And so this patient, this is a real patient that we saw in the emergency room at Johns Hopkins. And so she's got early syphilis, likely neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, likely otic syphilis, and syphilitic hepatitis. So really incredible constellation of findings. And so I want to remind you of a few things about patients. The first, the first issue that all of you know uh, was described very early on in the HIV epidemic by including uh, uh, Anne Rampalo here in her, in her paper on the left. And what we know is that in patients who are immunosuppressed who have HIV and other forms of immunosuppression, it is not unusual to find stages of syphilis be superimposed, particularly primary and secondary syphilis, and so that's not unusual. The other clinical manifestation that may be more likely to occur in individuals who are immunosuppressed, I should say that is more likely to occur in individuals that are immunosuppressed, is early neurosyphilis. So remember with syphilis that, and I, I'm sure Ann Rampalo went through this before, but with syphilis, the minute you get exposed within hours to just a few days, after exposure, the organism has already reached the central nervous system. So it's a systemic infection within hour to days after exposure, and we're talking here weeks before the primary chancre. That's why neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, and otic syphilis can occur during any stage of the infection, even before the chancre of primary syphilis appears. I've seen several patients 
who came in, they had neurosyphilis and they still hadn't developed a chancre and they developed the chancre after the diagnosis of neurosyphilis was made. So uh, remember that with uh, individuals who are immunosuppressed, that uh, primary and secondary syphilis can coexist. I've also seen that in patients who aren't immunosuppressed in rare cases. Also remember that early neurosyphilis, early ocular syphilis, early otic syphilis can occur in both immunosuppressed and non-immunosuppressed patients, but it tends to occur more frequently in immunosuppressed patients. The other thing that I want to remind you is that we spend a lot of time talking about the classic uh, lesions of syphilis, in particular the chancre. And the way we teach about the chancre is that it's a single lesion that is well circumscribed, that is painless, uh, and that's absolutely true. But in about up to 40% of patients, you can have multiple lesions, and those lesions can be painful. So in up to 40% of patients with syphilis who have primary syphilis, primary syphilis can look like herpes simplex with multiple painful lesions. So be very careful when you're assessing patients. Uh, you know, in many cases, you can make a clinical diagnosis uh, accurately, but in a number of cases, you will be misled. You will think that this is herpes when in fact it's syphilis. So it's really important when you have a patient that has lesions to actually test them for both herpes and syphilis, even though the clinical picture may not be perfect for syphilis. So that's something that's uh, important to remember. Now let's talk a little bit about ot otosyphilis. Otosyphilis is essentially the clinical manifestations of otosyphilis uh, are either hearing loss or ringing in the ears. Sometimes you can see some vestibular dysfunction so the patients can complain of dizziness, unsteadiness, etc. Otosyphilis can occur during any stage of the infection. We just talked about that. It can be early, it can be late, it can happen anytime. And so keep in mind, whenever you see a patient with syphilis, always ask, do you have ringing in your ears? Do you have hearing loss? Uh, of course, if a patient says, yes, I have hearing loss, uh, ask them, how long has it been going on? Oh, I've had hearing loss all my life. Okay, that's not otosyphilis. Also, the hard thing is when you have older patients who present with a, you know, with positive serologies for syphilis and they have hearing loss. That's always tough to know whether the hearing loss has to do with syphilis or it has nothing to do with syphilis. So it becomes more challenging in uh, elderly or older patients. But the diagnostic criteria, unfortunately, um, uh, are, are challenging because in up to 90% of patients who have otosyphilis, the CSF examination is completely normal. If you do an LP, the CSF will be completely normal in over 90% of patients with otosyphilis. So if you see a patient whose only symptom is uh, is consistent with otosyphilis. So they either have hearing loss or tinnitus, but they have no other neurological findings like headache, photophobia, et cetera. Then really you should not do a CSF examination because in the majority, the vast majority of patients who have otosyphilis, the CSF examination is going to be normal. In fact, the 2021 CDC treatment guidelines will say out, uh, you know, clearly that if there are only otic symptoms and signs, you do not need to do a CSF examination. But the problem is, if you think clinically, the patient has otosyphilis, right? There's no other explanation for these manifestations other than syphilis. Then you have to treat them the same way you treat neurosyphilis by giving them 14 days of IV penicillin. So while you don't need a CSF exam to make a diagnosis of otosyphilis, you do need to treat them for, with 14 days of IV penicillin, just like neurosyphilis. So otosyphilis, no LP, 14 days of IV penicillin. It can be unilateral in 50% of the patients, bilateral in the remaining patients. Uh, the treatment is IV penicillin. There's a lot of debate as to whether you should use corticosteroids as well. There are no good data on it. And so it really depends on the ENT doctor that comes to see them. Unless the patient has a really strong contraindication for corticosteroids, I usually am fine if they wanna give steroids. They usually give steroids for anywhere between two weeks to three weeks. 
And usually I'm fine with that if the patient is not a brittle diabetic or has some other contraindication. The prognosis of otic syphilis is essentially, it depends. Tinnitus, usually short-lived tinnitus, if they come in quickly when the tinnitus happens or when they have hearing loss, usually the prognosis is very good. You can reverse these findings. But if patients have had these symptoms for a while, months to years, the likelihood that you're going to reverse these findings is very low. But what you will do is you will stop the progression of disease by treating them. So um, hopefully that, is, uh, that covers otosyphilis. Ocular syphilis is uh, very similar in, in some respects. It can be 50%, so it can occur anytime during the course of syphilis, early to late. Um, and it, it can be unilateral in 50% of the patients, bilateral in the other 50%. Uh, any ocular manifestation can occur with syphilis from, anterior, from the anterior eye all the way to the back of the eye. Any ocular manifestation can occur with syphilis. All ocular manifestations have occurred with syphilis. Conjunctivitis, uveitis, retinitis, optic neuritis, all of that has been described with syphilis. So there is no pathognomonic finding, ocular finding with ocular syphilis. Every part of the eye can be involved during any stage of the infection. The vast majority of eye problems associated with syphilis are also associated with many other infectious and non-infectious diseases. Now, the one thing to keep in mind with ocular syphilis is that up to 40% of patients who have ocular syphilis will have a normal CSF examination. So if you had 100 patients with ocular syphilis, 40 of them will have a normal CSF examination. So the 2021 CDC treatment guidelines will say that if you have a patient that only has ocular signs and symptoms and no other neurologic signs or symptoms, you do not need to do a CSF examination, right? So you don't need to do a CSF examination if the patient only has ocular signs or only has otic signs or symptoms, because in many cases, the CSF examination is going to be normal. However, you have to treat them with 14 days of IV penicillin. So the story for ocular syphilis and otic syphilis is very similar. You don't need a CSF exam, but you need to treat them with uh, IV penicillin for um, uh, 14 days. Um, and so keep that in mind. Now, syphilitic hepatitis tends to occur in early syphilis and usually occurs with secondary syphilis or around the time of secondary syphilis. They have a very elevated alkaline phosphatase and just slightly elevated ASP and ALT. And usually these patients are asymptomatic, so you don't even diagnose it uh, unless you get blood work. And rarely do we get liver function tests. But if somebody comes in and they have liver function tests and you see this, these parameters on the liver function test, think of syphilis as a possibility, as a possible cause of hepatitis. And uh, remember that the treatment of secondary syphilis with one dose of 2.4 million units of benzathine penicillin G will cure syphilitic hepatitis. So it will cure syphilitic hepatitis. So when should we do a CSF examination on a patient? When should you order a lumbar puncture on your patient? And I think the most obvious time is when a patient has neurological signs or symptoms. So, and the reason why is because in neurosyphilis, I'm not talking about ocular syphilis, I'm not talking about otic syphilis, I'm talking about neurosyphilis. They're, they're distinct entities. We tend to group them together because they're treated the same way, but they really are distinct entities. Neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, otic syphilis. If they have neurological signs or symptoms, headache, photophobia, cranial nerve abnormalities, weakness, stroke, anything like that, those are neurological findings and you need to do a CSF examination because all patients who have neurosyphilis will have abnormalities on their CSF examination, either a positive CSF VDRL or white cells in the CSF. If their CSF or an elevated protein, I hate that one because it's so nonspecific, but elevated protein is also a diagnostic criterion. So if you have a patient, if you have a patient that comes in and they have neurological signs and symptoms, 
Only neurological signs and symptoms. No ocular, no otic. Do a lumbar puncture. If the lumbar puncture is negative, it's all normal, they don't have neurosyphilis. You can rule out neurosyphilis. That's why it's important to do a lumbar puncture in patients who have neurological signs or symptoms. It's also important to ask all your patients that come in with evidence of syphilis, ask them about ocular signs and symptoms, otic signs and symptoms, and neurological signs and symptoms. Now, we talked about ocular signs and symptoms, and we talked about otic signs and symptoms. And the answer is, if they only have otic, if they only have ocular, you don't need to do a lumbar puncture because you're going to treat them whether the lumbar puncture is normal or abnormal. On the other hand, if they have neurological signs or symptoms only, if the lumbar puncture is normal, you don't have to treat them for neurosyphilis. Now, the big question comes up is, what do you do when the serologies don't uh, respond appropriately. So you have a patient that has um, syphilis and you treat them. Uh, and uh, let's say their first titer is one to 512. And they come back and their titer at six months is still at one to 512. And uh, at one year, their titer is uh, at one to 256. So their titer hasn't gone, come down completely. What do you do with these patients? We're gonna deal with that in the second case presentation. And the short answer is nobody really knows. In most cases, a lumbar puncture doesn't really reveal anything. And so uh, uh, hold on to that one. We're gonna come back to it in just a second. What about your HIV infected patient? Should you be doing lumbar punctures in your HIV infected patients? And the answer is, this is my answer because there's no perfect answer, but I think the CDC agrees uh, with the fact that if they are completely asymptomatic neurologically, if they have no neurological symptoms, then you don't need to do a lumbar puncture in your HIV infected patients. I do not do a lumbar puncture except in patients that have uh, neurological signs or symptoms or in patients that have tertiary syphilis. So they come in and they have a gamma uh, or they come in and they're diagnosed with cardiovascular syphilis. It's very rare. I only see one or two cases every few years. And in those cases, I do a lumbar puncture because if they have uh, neurological involvement, I will treat them with 14 days of IV penicillin if they don't have neurological involvement, then the treatment of tertiary syphilis is IM benzathine penicillin. So it changes the management. So I do a lumbar puncture only if a patient has neurological signs or symptoms, or if a patient has tertiary syphilis. And then we'll talk about the serologies coming up next. So this is no, no, maybe, uh, not really no, and yes, I do the lumbar puncture with tertiary syphilis. And the CDC guidelines also recommend it. So here, let's go back to our patient who had all of these clinical manifestations of syphilis. The LP was done because the patient, she had neurological signs and symptoms. And so we did an LP, and the LP showed 67 white cells. The majority were lymphocytes, and the protein was high, and the VDRL, CSF VDRL, was reactive. So we know for sure that this patient has neurological syphilis. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Uh, so, but in this case, the CSF examination did not change the treatment. Even if her LP were negative, she had ocular signs and she had otic signs, we would still treat her with 14 days of IV penicillin, even if her LP were negative, because she had ocular and otic signs. You might say, why did they do an LP? You could easily not have done an LP, uh, and still you would need you would still have treated her with 14 days of IV penicillin, uh, and so keep that in mind. It's a decision that's a clinical decision that was made. Uh, by the time they consulted us, I went down, saw the patient. I was like, you know what? I wouldn't have done the LP, but I'm glad you did. This confirms syphilis. Let's move on. Uh, and so it's a it's an approach that you can decide whether you want to do the LP or not. So what's the point of performing a CSF examination? Uh, the CSF examination in the 2015 treatment guidelines, you, because you, you want a CSF examination at baseline so that you can follow the patients. Uh, so if a patient has neurosyphilis and you do a baseline CSF examination, uh, 
and there, there are, of course, abnormalities. Let's say three months after you treat the patient, the patient starts getting worse or says, oh my God, my headaches are getting worse. You can do a follow-up CSF examination and look to see if there's any objective measure for worsening of the neurosyphilis. If there is, you would retreat them. If there's no objective measures, you might say, let's follow and see how you do. So there is uh, some uh, evidence that by following these patients, um, by doing a CSF examination initially, uh, it can be helpful when you're following the patients. They also used to recommend, the CDC used to recommend that you should do, as all CSF uh, abnormalities should become normal by the end of two years after the initial treatment of neurosyphilis. So you have two years to clear your CSF exam, uh, your CSF parameters, otherwise you need to be retreated. Nobody does that. I don't know of a single clinician that follows these patients and keeps doing LPs up to two years. It's just hard to convince patients to do the LP. The good news is that there have been several studies that have shown that uh, in fact, uh, the serum RPR decline, if a patient's RPR titers decline appropriately in the period of time over two years, then these patients' CSF will have normalized as well. And so uh, there have been several studies that have shown that. The first one was by Christina Mara, and there have been se subsequent studies from China that essentially say if the serologies get better and the patient is clinically better, you don't need to follow them with a CSF exam. And in the 2021 treatment guidelines from the CDC, there will be a sentence that says, if the serological titers respond appropriately after treatment, and if the patient is clinically well, doesn't have neurological signs or symptoms that persist, you don't need to do any follow-up CSF examination. So that's gonna be a change between the 2015 and the 2021 treatment guidelines. So how can we make uh, the diagnosis of neurosyphilis better? Remember, uh, Anne Rampalo talked to you about this. The CSF VDRL is very specific. So if you find it in the CSF, the patient has neurosyphilis, but it's not very sensitive. 50% of patients who have neurosyphilis have a negative CSF VDRL. Uh, there are treponemal tests that, are, uh, that can be done on the CSF. The problem with the treponemal tests is that these treponemal tests um, are essentially uh, very sensitive, but they're not specific. So in other words, usually everybody that has neurosyphilis has a positive treponemal test in their CSF. But uh, if you find a positive treponemal set test in the CSF, not everybody has neurosyphilis. So they're not very specific. And so in the near future, they are looking at treponemal tests that have titers. And so by adding a titer to the treponemal test, you can make that test very specific and very sensitive. So in the near future, it is likely that we will be obtaining a treponemal test with a titer. And based on that titer, we will be able to diagnose neurosyphilis with high sensitivity and high specificity. Stay tuned, that's coming up in the near future. Okay, now we're gonna to come to our second uh, patient, RJ. This is a 38-year-old man who presents with low-grade fevers and a rash for three days. He noticed a painless ulcer that appeared on his penis a week earlier and severe rectal pain associated with defecation. He has a past history of pneumocystis pneumonia He's HIV infected, uh, and he has a history of gonorrhea, three episodes, one of which was a pharyngeal gonorrhea. He denies any tobacco, any drugs. He's had three male sex partners in the last three months, all of, which, uh, all of whom were HIV negative, and he uh, has inconsistent condom use. He notes that he has diffuse rash, well, you note a diffuse rash and a penile ulcer, and I'll show you the picture. He also has exquisite tenderness on digital rectal examination. Uh, there were no lesions noted around the anus or any other mucosal site. And so um, these are the lesions. So you can see the rash that he has over here, rash close up, rash close up. And then he's got this lesion, a well circumscribed painless ulcer on his penis. So what he has most likely the diagnosis is he has primary syphilis superimposed on 
the secondary syphilis, the secondary manifestations of syphilis. And so the laboratory results from this patient uh, show that he's got a treponemal test that's reactive and an RPR that's reactive at 1 to 32. Uh, the rectal and pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia NATs are negative, and his rectal HSV PCR is negative, and so most likely he also has syphilitic proctitis, syphilitic proctitis. Um, and so he has primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, syphilitic proctitis. And so this patient has early syphilis, and he was treated with one dose of 2.4 million units of intramuscular benzathine penicillin G, uh, his initial serology, as you remember, was 1 to 32. At three months, it came down to 1 to 16. At six months, 1 to 16. At 12 months, it's still 1 to 16. So he has not achieved the fourfold decline. You want to see him go down to 1 to 8 to call him a serological cure. So he has not yet achieved a serological, an adequate serological decline. And so the question is, what do you do? What should you do in these patients? Should you do a lumbar puncture? Should you retreat them? What do you do with these patients? And so the options are don't do anything, just wait and continue to follow them. Uh, you can treat them with three doses of benzathine penicillin G empirically. Just say, listen, I don't know what's going on. The patient is asymptomatic, but their titer didn't come down. I'm just gonna give them three doses of benzathine penicillin and call it a day or should you perform a repeat CSF examination? And the answer is, we're not sure. <laughs> Nobody really knows what the right answer is. In my opinion, either A or B are reasonable, and what I do, if the patient is reliable, if the patient will come back for follow-up, if it's a reasonably reliable patient, I will usually just do A. I will wait and continue to follow. I will tell the patient, listen, if you develop any headaches, any you know, eye symptoms, any otic symptoms, I explain to them what they are. If you develop any of these, call me right away. Otherwise, we're just gonna see you in six months and we'll continue to follow you. I usually don't retreat, and I'll show you some data about that. And I usually don't perform a CSF examination, and I'll show you some data about that too. So these are your options though. And all of these options are appropriate. Nobody's going to argue with you if you want to pick one of these options. You have to figure out what you think is the best approach. I feel that continuing to follow these patients is the best approach for me. So the first question is, is a CSF examination necessary in asymptomatic persons who do not achieve a fourfold decline in non-treponemal titers after therapy? Nobody knows the answer to that question. The CDC treatment guidelines said you can consider, you can consider a CSF examination, but first wait for a full 12 months in patients who have early syphilis and a full 24 months if a patient has a late latent syphilis. So keep in mind, don't even think about doing a CSF examination if the patient is asymptomatic until you've waited at least a year for patients with early syphilis or two years for patients with late syphilis. Don't even think about it, just keep following. After that, you can consider doing a CSF examination. So does this persistent uh, titer that didn't go down fourfold, does that predict a poor clinical outcome? Do these patients do worse uh, because they get neurological signs or symptoms, et cetera? And the answer is we don't have great data, but in the short term, these patients don't do worse. Uh, and so they did these studies where they looked at these patients whose titers didn't go down, and they did LPs, and in some cases they treated some but didn't treat others and they didn't find a difference between those who got treated or those who didn't get treated. They didn't find a difference in those who got an LP versus those who didn't get the LP in the short term, in the near term. There doesn't seem to be a difference. And that's the reason why I choose to just follow these patients instead of doing an LP or, doing, um, uh, or uh, treating them again. There, the data don't suggest that there are better outcomes in the short term. Now, long-term data, we don't know. We don't have information about long-term data. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, we don't know. And that's a problem. And that's why some people say, you know what? 
I don't know what the short term, I don't know what the long term data are. So I'm just going to treat them again with three doses of benzathine penicillin G. Fine, do it. It's okay. There is nobody's going to argue with you. Nobody's going to have a problem with you. Some people say, I want to do an LP. I want to make sure they don't have CSF involvement. Fine, do it. Nobody's going to argue with you. But it is an invasive test. And that one, I feel like you have to really think strongly about it. Uh, but I think all of these options are not unreasonable. I just wait and follow. Invariably, these titers will come down at some point. Um, and so that's the good news. So you decide in this patient not to do a repeat CSF examination. Should you treat them some more with additional antibiotics? And the answer, like I said before, is they did studies. There have been at least three trials that have they're not trials, they're observational studies that have given some patients antibiotics, three doses, and other patients uh, nothing, just follow. And both groups did the same when you followed them for another year. Some titers went down, other titers didn't go down. It didn't matter whether they got treatment or not. So there's no significant difference even when you treat some patients and when you don't treat others. Again, that's why I don't do B. I don't treat, again, in most of these patients as long as they're clinically doing well. Remember, you're always asking these patients, do you have a headache? Do you have you know, eye problems? Do you have uh, decreased hearing? Those are questions you always ask these patients because if they say yes to anything, that changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. As long as the patient is asymptomatic, then I think it's reasonable just to follow that patient. So you decide to wait and follow the patient. Uh, and I think that you are a smart person. Uh, uh, you are a wise person. Uh, and you, I, try, I tend to do less. I feel that often less is more. And, and so I try to do as, as little as I, as I can get away with, with patients. But some other people feel differently, and that's OK. Uh, you have to decide which way you want to go. I think all of these things are reasonable. And so what do I do in summary with somebody who's asymptomatic, who experiences an inadequate serological response? The first thing you do is you obtain a good follow-up history and perform a physical examination. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, if somebody comes in and their titers haven't gone down, right? The last time you saw them was four months ago and their titers didn't go down. The first thing you have to ask is, did you have another exposure? If they had another exposure that could be a cause of reinfection, treat them, absolutely treat them. Uh, and so that's really important. If they don't have a, 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 a possibility of reinfection, then ask yourself the question, did you wait an appropriate amount of time? 12 months for early syphilis, 24 months for late latent. The 2021 guidelines are no longer gonna say six to 12 months wait for early syphilis, 12 to 24 months wait for late syphilis. They're gonna say 12 months for early syphilis, 24 months for late syphilis, wait at least that amount of time. Then think about one, what you want to do. If the patient's reliable, if they're asymptomatic, it's perfectly reasonable to follow them, to continue to follow them. Uh, however, if you feel strongly, by all means, you can treat them with three doses of benzathine penicillin and follow them. And if you feel really, really, really strongly, you can also do a CSF examination in those cases. Again, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. You have to figure out what you want to do. I want to thank Ethel Weld for um, actually uh, providing me. She was uh, the, the ID attending who initially saw the first patient, and then she invited me to see the patient with her. And so I'm very grateful to her for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found this useful. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I wish you all a happy new year. So I'm going to look in the, in the Q&A, right? OK, so yes, feel free to go ahead and put your um, questions in the Q&A box. Um, and I will keep checking them. Now, one thing that while people are entering their questions, if there are any questions, one thing that I didn't address is what do you do with a patient? Let's say you have patient NN who comes in and you treat them with, with uh, and their titer is 1 to 32. And then the next time they come in and with 1 to 16 titer. Great. You don't do anything. But then the following time, they come in with a 1 to 256 titer. Now their titer has gone up fourfold. 
what do you do? In those cases, in those cases, that's different. Uh, if they say, yes, I've been exposed to, you know, I've had unprotected sex, then you can just retreat them uh, for reinfection. But if some of them will say, listen, I absolutely did not have sex since the last time I saw you, and their titer has gone up fourfold, in those cases, then I think it's reasonable to do a CSF examination to make sure they don't have asymptomatic neurosyphilis. So if the titers don't go down, you can keep following. But if the titers go up fourfold after you treat them and they didn't get reinfected, then I think a CSF examination is normal. I'll tell you how I approach those patients because sometimes patients don't tell you about an exposure. So I'll say this, I don't ask them, did you have an exposure? I'll say, listen, your titers have gone up fourfold since the last time I saw you. There are two possibilities with this. Either you got reinfected or uh, there is, you have involvement of the brain, CNS, with neurosyphilis. And in order to make that diagnosis, I need to do a lumbar puncture. And I explain to them what the lumbar puncture is. Then I say, okay, tell me, were you, did you have any kind of exposure that could potentially have gotten you reinfected? And so that way they know what your plan is and they can make a decision about whether they want to share with you uh, a, a history of reinfection or not. So that's the way I approach those patients. There is a question now. I have two questions for recommendations for treatment in an STD clinic environment via PCP. RPR 256 treated adequately. Follow up tests at six months later is still 256. Would you, treat, would you recommend treatment for potential reinfection or continue to follow because it has been less than 12 months? So the first thing I always tell people is always ask at any visit for the potential for reinfection. If a patient gives you a history that it's possible that they could have gotten reinfected, just treat them. Treat them. Don't take any risks treat them. But if the patient says, no, doc, I haven't had any sex, I haven't had unprotected sex, et cetera, then I would just follow them. You know, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that titers and syphilis should not be interpreted. You shouldn't interpret any syphilis titers without a good history. The only way to adequately treat patients, manage patients with syphilis, is to have the titers and to have a really good history. And of course, you can never be sure with patients. But if a patient says, no, I haven't been re-exposed, then I wouldn't treat them. I would follow them for a full 12 months. And in some cases, I would follow them even longer. Uh, so thank you very much for that question. Now, let's go with uh, the next one. Patient was adequately treated after a 1 to 64 RPR three years ago. Never had follow-up testing. They're screened now and they have an RPR of 1 to 8. Do you recommend treatment because you cannot rule out that their RPR would have gone to not? That's a great question. And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, I think I would recommend treatment if the patient says, well, yeah, I've been having unprotected sex. In that case, I would say, okay, just give them three doses of benzathine penicillin as syphilis of unknown duration and start fresh from there on. If the patient says, no, I've been in a monogamous relationship, I haven't had unprotected sex, et cetera, I would just, and if they have no neurological signs or symptoms, no ocular signs or symptoms, no otic signs or symptoms, I think I would just follow them. Again, I think the history from the patient helps you make those decisions. Again, I also understand that it's not always the most reliable history, but sometimes you do your best. And if you suspect that the patient may not be truthful, is not giving you the whole answer, you're worried, just go ahead and treat them. It's okay to treat them. Um, uh, and so I think that you just have to uh, do your best to try and figure out whether you think reinfection has happened or not. And it's not 100%, I get that, but do your best. Go with your gut feeling and decide whether you need to retreat them or not. Uh, there's another question. Thank you very much for those questions, by the way. They're fabulous questions. Um, uh, so Sheila is asking, I was informed recently by infectious disease specialist that Visalin times three should be given pending the patient being referred for a CSF. What are your thoughts about this and the impact of the CSF results? So my answer to this is, so it depends on the, the, the situation. Let me tell you, if the patient has any symptoms, be it ocular, otic, or, uh, or uh, neurological, you should refer them immediately. Uh, they may not get a CSF examination, 
but they need to be referred immediately to have an ophthalmologic exam, to have ENT check their ears, and if they have neurological signs or symptoms, to have a lumbar puncture. They should be referred immediately. In Maryland, we had two, two cases where they had ocular signs and symptoms, and the patient, they called the ophthalmologist, the patient's ophthalmologist, and the ophthalmologist said, sure, I'll see them in three days. The patient went home, came back uh, a day later, and was blind in one eye, and it was irreversible. And the other patient was actually had loss of vision in both eyes that was fortunately reversible. So the take-home message is, if they are symptomatic, you don't waste any time, send them to the emergency room. Uh, and call the emergency room and say, listen, I have a patient that's coming in, I suspect ocular syphilis, make sure that an ophthalmologist sees them. I have a patient that's coming in, they have neurosyphilis, make sure that the NLP is done. On the other hand, there is the other. So in those patients, I don't give them any treatment. I send them to get evaluated immediately. On the other hand, there are the asymptomatic patients, right? The patients that if you decide to do a lumbar puncture, if their titers went up, but they're asymptomatic. Uh, if, they decide, if you decide to do a lumbar puncture, uh, and let's say the lumbar puncture is not going to get done for another week, should you treat them? Yeah, I would give them a dose of benzathine penicillin G in that case. And you know what? If the lumbar puncture comes out normal in a week, good news, you don't have to treat them with IV penicillin. So I don't think it matters if you treat them ahead of time and the lumbar puncture comes back negative. If the lumbar puncture comes back negative at any time, you don't have to treat them for neurosyphilis. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, I don't give uh, benzathine penicillin G if they need to be evaluated immediately. I send them and make sure that they go for evaluation. Um, and then for those that don't necessarily need an LP immediately, you can give them benzathine penicillin G. I usually don't. I just send them for the LP and, and that. But it has nothing to do with the LP not being useful anymore. Because you know what? If the LP becomes normal with that one dose of benzathine penicillin G, two thumbs up. You don't need to give them any, any more uh, IV penicillin. Uh, so good, thank you very much for asking that question. It's a fabulous question. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, thank you very much. Those were really fabulous questions and they're tough. You know, this is all the gray area of syphilis. Uh, we don't have great data and hopefully I've given you my approach that you will find useful, that you can either agree with or disagree with and that's okay. Um, uh, we are all in the same boat. And I respect people who say, listen, Khalil, um, you don't want to treat these patients. I feel better treating them. I say, absolutely, go ahead and treat them uh, because we don't have data. We don't have great data. And so um, I feel like the physician in charge should be making those decisions. Any other questions? Nothing else? I thank you all very much. And I will mention again that um, if sometime you have uh, an unusual case or you have a question about management, um, you can feel free to come to our consultation website, which is www.stdccn.org. Um, and those consultation websites come to our experts as well. Yes, we absolutely encourage you uh, to use the, uh, the, um, the consultation network. It's free. Um, you can put in your, your question and within literally sometimes minutes, if not hours, uh, you will have an answer to that question. And usually any syphilis question comes to either me or Jean or Anne, and we're more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. So please use that. It's a very valuable tool. Thank you all very much. Um, uh, Barbara, do you have any final words uh, uh, to, to, to say? Do they, um, do they need to fill out anything? I don't know. Yes, I do. I'm going to stop the recording first now. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ghanem. See you soon, everyone. Happy New Year.